Hello, everyone. Thanks for your final hour. Thanks for not dying in the heat. Uh, this talk will be about varnish and how to potentially speed up your website or the website of the developers that you are maintaining the service for. Who am I and why should you believe something I say? My name is Matthias. I am the support manager at Nucleus. We're a managed hosting provider. Uh, I also run two services on the site business called ODIR, which monitors websites, and DNSPy, which monitors DNS. If you care about any of those uh, topics, give them a try, free trials, etc. blah, blah. I also ran a newsletter service. Um, just to check who was subscribed. Ah, more than I would have thought. OK. Maybe I'll bring it back. Maybe I won't. Uh, very time consuming. Never, never name something weekly. Call something cron random, whatever. Not weekly. Um. So Varnish. What is Varnish? Varnish is going to be um, an additional tool that you can introduce into your server stack. But in order to understand what Varnish is and what Varnish can do, you need to understand HTTP. So just like the DNS talk a few, uh, few talks back, um, we're going to give a quick introduction to what is HTTP because you need to grok uh, this before you can implement Varnish. Protocol knowledge is going to be required. I had the, 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 the luxury that I needed to implement Varnish and as a result learned HTTP. I think the other way around is much more healthy um, and much more fun <laughs> um, to get started. Varnish is going to be all about HTTP headers. Um, client side response, all of that is controlled with headers. Uh, Varnish listens to all of those. Request response, you know the drill. What does it look like? Um, a typical HTTP request, you can just tell that to a random server as long as you try it on HTTP. Um, you will get requests for the slash, say the home page, and you define the protocol you'd like to request. Then you get a series of key value pairs. You'd like to accept whichever value the server wants to send back. So you, uh, this say, uh, meaning you uh, accept any kind of encoding that is either gzip or deflate. So it basically you want compressed content, not just plain text. To the server that you've connected to, you will say what website you're actually trying to, which, uh, trying to load, what, what host header you, uh, you want. Um, additionally, a lot of servers, if you just connect to them and say you'd like to request localhost, you will sometimes get debug information that it's not supposed to be um, uh, exposed to the outside. You'll say which user agent you are, your cookies will be sent along, etc., etc. This is the HTTP protocol in a nutshell. So very simple key value pairs, um, always separated with a colon. Um, the same thing applies to HTTP2 as well. That's just a binary protocol, but semantics stay the same. Value. Uh, key values. And as a response, your server is going to be very polite and just re reply with whatever uh, you requested. It will confirm the protocol, give an HTTP status code and a text, which doesn't mean anything. It's just for human readable consumption. It will tell you, might tell you, um, the cache control that should be, um, should be adhered to on this object, on this, this thing. Um, this means a cache control is private. If I request it versus my colleague versus anyone here, we should all get a different response. That's the idea. It will confirm the content encoding. So this part is still plain text. All of the headers sent and response in HTTP 1 are plain text, regardless if you're getting a gzipped response. Um, so the headers being plain text, in this case, will say, OK, what is going to follow next is going to be compressed. It will confirm how many bytes should be um, received by the client, and after which it could uh, end the connection. It will confirm the content type, etc., etc. Lots of commercial information headers, um, confirm the date, blah, blah. That's the ID, server, client. Um, but how does Varnish tie into this? For starters, it's a proxy. So it's going to sit between the user agent, the browser, versus the server. Um, simple proxy like you have many others. And it will decide on its own whether a connection that came in should be served from cache or should be served from whichever was running in the backend. And to do so, it will listen to HTTP headers. Those cache control headers that are probably a dozen or so um, headers that actually control if content can or cannot be cached. And Varnish is actually very simple, and it will just listen to those headers. If those headers are correct, Varnish will work correctly. If you've ever worked with developers or if you are a developer, um, you probably know that it's never that easy to implement. Varnish has the ability to write code. It has routines within its entire flow that you can extend, that you can write code in to man manipulate requests, modify requests, uh, you name it. And we'll get to those in a second. So this is your typical connection. You have a user who is going to use a user agent, the browser in most cases, which will connect to a web server running Apache, Ruby, you name it. 
add varnish in the mix and it'll just sit in between. It doesn't have to be a separate box, of course. If you sh shuffle your ports around, um, you can run varnish on the same box that runs the actual web server. And if you look at the varnish documentation and ask varnish, hey, how do you work? You get a really complicated uh, flowchart that looks like this. We're all very smart people. I'm very sure of that. Um, I, I do not understand this because this, this actually goes on for a couple of miles below. Um, I can't wrap my head around the flowchart like this. It would take too long to, to consume all the information. In my head, I have a simpler way of visualizing varnish and how it goes from a request to a server and back, which isn't entirely complete. As in, it is complete, but varnish, as I mentioned, has a lot of routines. It has 20 or 30 of those places that you can hook your logic into. Most of them don't even matter. Four of them are very important. To give a quick example, well, or not. Um, wait. The example is not that important, but it will help visualize things. Um, I was talking about live demos. <laughs> should not have done this, or at least tested the Wi Fi. Um, nah, it's. Uh, my iPhone is willing to. If not, some slides will uh, will come up. So, nah, I'll get back to that a bit later. This is varnish visualized. This is the proxy that sits between your client and your server. This can be a single box, or this can be a separate server um, on the network. What is going to con what is going to happen when a user agent connects to varnish? Is it going to trigger a routine called the VCL receive. VCL stands for the Varnish Configuration Language. It's a bit of nomenclature that you just remember. Um, the receive hook is the very first part in Varnish where you can start to manipulate a request. So a client makes a request for the home page. In this place, you can start uh, dropping cookies, saying that perhaps you'll never want to serve a plain text version, only a gzipped version, etc. After this, Varnish is going to look up that request that the client made in its cache. Best case scenario, it has a hit, so Varnish triggers its final routine called the VCL deliver. And this is the last routine before content is pushed back to your client. So before the HTML, with all the headers, the entire DOM is going to be sent back to the client. This is the best case scenario because you have a cache hit, couldn't be faster. And the user is happily served. Of course, the first hit can never be a cache hit, so if the cache lookup fails, Varnish is going to trigger a different routine, the backend fetch, um, where obviously it's going to fetch the content that was requested from the backend. That in turn will talk to whatever you define, a node application, whatever. Once that thing here has spent its seconds generating response, that is back delivered to Varnish, and Varnish triggers yet another routine. A lot of, lot of routines in Varnish. The backend response, which is another place that you can look, uh, hook code into where you can add logic, where you can drop requests, manipulate them, rewrite them, restart them. Um, afterwards, it's stored in the cache, and the same deliver routine is hit, triggering it back to the client. So this is the worst case scenario. Couldn't be served from cache, served from the backend. What does this look like? So Varnish is powered by the VCL. It's Varnish configuration language. It is a C-like syntax, so think JavaScript, PHP, um, that you can add logic to. Emphasis on the can. Um, by default, if you just yum install or apt install varnish, um, it'll work out of the box, but it won't have any rules. So by default, it will listen to HTTP headers, an HTTP header coming in versus one coming out. If, in theory, all of that works flawlessly, you don't have to configure varnish and it'll just work out of the box. Um, practice, not so much, and we'll get into the edge cases a bit later. This is what a file by default sort of looks like. So usually it resides in etc varnish. Uh, default of VCL is your default configuration file. Above we specify the varnish, the syntax compatibility that we would like from varnish. And we define several subroutines. All sub, space, and then the, the name of the routine. And in curly brackets the code that is going to be executed. This is plain text, but it's a C-like syntax. So every time you start or restart varnish, Varnish is going to compile this to a binary blob and load that into memory. Catch here is you need the GCC or something that can compile on your production system if you want to run this. There are workarounds which are not always that feasible. 
it's easier to have GCC installed, but security, etc. This is what it looks like. Um, so you have a routine within your curly brackets. You can write code, if statements, um, but actually it's very limited code. You can't write loops, just if statements and uh, regular expressions to substitute data. But all th those things combined, just if statements and a couple of regexes, I think we all know, can go a long way. Within uh, our receive statement, we have an object called the request, REQ. In it, we can access anything that the client is sending to us. So we can ask it if it's a get or a post or a put um, and write logic surrounding that. For instance, if it is not a get or a head request, it could be a post, a patch or whatever, it's probably not something we can cache. There's going to be something that is going to manipulate data on the back end and we need to send that to the back end. So if it's not a get or a head, by default, we could pass. Technically, yes, you can cache a post, but I have not yet found a use case where that is useful. Next thing you encounter, especially if, if um, deep diving HTTP hasn't really happened yet, is the internet resolves around cookies. And the more of them, the better. At least that's developer mindset. Um, so you're going to try to normalize the cookies that a client is going to send to your server. If you've ever implemented Google Analytics, which is probably every website in the world, um, you know that they add a lot of cookies, double underscores, UTM, then some random characters, which is useful for Google Analytics to track us, not so much for the back end. But every one of these is going to be a uni unique value to identify each and every one of us. But if that's the case, then probably our caching is going to be unique for each and every one of us, and that sort of defies the purpose of caching. Um, so we can use regular, sub regular expressions to look at the request HTTP, and in this stanza, you find all of the headers that a client sends, which includes the cookie header. So you have access to all the cookies. And then comes the magic, which is usually copy-pastable uh, till forever. Here's a pattern, which may include any value, and you replace it with nothing. AKA, you strip anything that matches that pattern. From that point forward, your client still has those cookies. We don't touch the client. But the server, or varnish, is going to think those cookies never existed. So you sort of normalize and clean up whatever the client is going to send to you. And all of this happens in the very first block that Varnish is going to hit before a cache lookup is going to happen. So before any of these cookies can manipulate your, your cache hit rate. On top of that, if you uh, remember that cookies are sent for every request that you make, all of your cookies are going to be sent for CSS files, JavaScript files, everything that doesn't really need cookies in the first place. So you can write a regular expression, uh, which says that everything that matches the URL ending on one of these file types, just drop the cookie altogether. The backend doesn't care if you have one or 20 cookies for a JPEG. It just cares that it wants to deliver the JPEG. If you drop all the cookies, chances are the next request coming in, one of us, um, is going to be the exact same because we've disregarded all cookies altogether. So we do a lookup to try and look up the, the cached file, the cached PNG, XML, you name it. There's one small catch that I should, uh, should emphasize too. Um, code like this is going to make it seem like your varnish is running optimally because you're basically stripping all the cookies from static content. Um, and you can see a 90 or 95% cache hit rate on your system because most of your hits are going to be static files. But those 5% that are not cache hits, those are probably the heaviest ones. Those are your PHP, Ruby, Node hits. And those might not be cached. So take this with a grain of salt. In most cases, it's probably better to skip this altogether. Perhaps never cache your static files, because yes, they do bandwidth and disk I.O. and you name it. But it's minimal compared to actually hitting PHP. Um, so it might be more interesting to not cache static content. On the backend side, basically, whatever your server has sent back before it's stored in the cache, you can do the same manipulation. Um, maybe some of your content is going to trigger cookies being added, especially if you route um, image files through a thumbnail, instant, uh, thumbnail system in PHP or whatever. That PHP can set a cookie, a session ID cookie, back, but that doesn't matter for static content. So whenever the backend request is going to be adding an HTTP header called the set cookie header, you can drop that for static content. With the same caveat as before, Maybe you don't want to drop cookies for static content. Varnish also allows us to introduce a bit of intelligence or graceful handling of downtime. Um, 
when it receives a response from the backend, um, it can look at the status code. Maybe it was an error page. We probably don't want to cache that. Um, maybe it was an error page that signals that we can restart the request without harm of twice manipulating the same data. So if you look at the backend response and we look at the status code, if it's an error, we probably don't want to cache, so we abandon altogether. Basically, we serve an error page to our user. But we can also add retry logic. This piece in Varnish can retry the same request and perhaps use that response. Could be useful if you just had a single SQL query that failed, but the next one works. Um, mostly useful for harmless GET requests, not so useful for posts that manipulate your data. On top of this, normally you, um, you can send how long a page can be cached through its cache headers the cache control header that we might see. Um, but if that cache expires, say you want to cache something for 60 seconds, and the 61st second a new user comes in, it doesn't have a page anymore. But that's where Grace, among other things, comes in handy. It will allow, it will allow Varnish to store things beyond its TTL in its cache, assuming there is memory or space available to store that request. So even if something has expired, and the next user comes in, it can serve that expired request to serve it in milliseconds, and in the background, fetch new content. Um, this is useful especially to uh, avoid cache stampede. So if your cache expires, you don't want hundreds of people requesting the same page. Um, this can make it that even an expired page can still be served from cache. Probably not convenient in any use case, but in most it is. On the deliver end, basically the last page, the last routine that we can hit before sending it all the way to our client, we can add or remove additional headers. Um, Varnish doesn't really have a very clean mechanism of all of those routines that we saw of making variables and passing those variables along. What most people do is they add um, additional headers in each routine to check the value of previous headers um, or previous variables. Of course, you'll want to clean that up before you send those info back to your client. Uh, in the last routine, you can. Uh, this is something that you often see in production systems too, to see if you actually had a cache hit or miss, which is useful for debugging purposes. Um, but you can add if statements saying that if it is a magic IP address, say the office IP uh, of your clients, that you can add the debug headers to show more information for particular users. And we often try to clean up headers that shouldn't even exist in the first place. Um, X powered by is something that PHP likes to add to emphasize which version you're running. You probably don't want to expose that to the outside world either. And you can do this in Varnish without touching the web server, without informing a dev. You probably should inform them. Um, but it gives you, as a sysadmin, more freedom to manipulate what goes back to the client. So you can clean up before it's delivered. But this introduces a couple of challenges. We, I only touched on four routines very briefly. In reality, there are 20 or more. Um, each of those routines gives you the power to change a header, add a header, remove a header, basically change the request altogether. There are a lot of places where you can modify a request. Wh what comes in versus what comes out. If you add all of those regular expressions, you probably have a set of cookies to begin with. You have a set of cookies that comes out. What's the input? What's the output? And where should you manipulate a request? You can do it in a lot of places, but what's the best place to look for um, to add your code or to change your code? These are questions that don't really have a ready-made answer. Um, but if we look at a couple of scenarios that will hopefully <laughs> uh, further explain where you can change these. If you don't agree with me, you can change them at any place where you'd like. By default, Varnish is going to make a cache lookup for every request that comes in. And it is going to look at three distinct keys um, to determine what separates me from you. By, for starters, it's going to look at the URL that you're requesting, which makes sense, slash account versus slash profile, different pages. It's also going to look at the host header, google.com versus yahoo.com, different pages. And it'll look at the cookies that are sent by the client to the server. Um, and this is something that probably triggers a lot of cache fails. Because by default, most applications set a unique session ID in a cookie for each and every one of us. Um, PHP can do this by default. Ruby can do this by default, which is useful as a developer. You always have a session at hand, and you can track a user through different pages. Not so useful for a caching engine, 
because suddenly all of us, according to this mechanism, are unique. We all have a separate session ID, thus a separate hash for our cookies, no more caching. This is something that if you want to um, introduce Varnish into a um, developer controlled stack, or basically if you're responsible for a set of developers, um, this is going to be the part that is going to require most work, probably on the dev end, sanitizing cookies, only setting session IDs when you need them. Um, don't throw data in cookies assuming it's just free storage, um, because it will mess up any cache hit rate. Knowing now what three elements by default are separating us from each other, um, which by the way you can just add data to, so this, this VCL hash, this is just the same code we saw earlier. You can add headers, say if you want to um, implement a REST API, and sometimes you have an XML response, sometimes a JSON response. You'll probably want to hash the accept as well, as in, is this an XML or is this a JSON response? So you can just add permutations of your cache in the hash. In the VCL receive, so again, the, the very first hit before a cache lookup is done, um, you can do sort of intelligence things like sort the query arguments. Those things behind the question mark. Um, the example shows this is actually the very same page. Lang is an L at the front versus at the back. But to varnish, by default, this is different. Your URL is different. Hence, different version of the cache. If you've ever sent something with Google Analytics to track campaigns, something your marketing folks will enjoy, um, every um, mail sent out can potentially include unique tracking parameters per sent link usually included in UTM underscore and then a set of, um, set of parameters, you can just remove them in varnish because to your backend, they probably don't matter. I say probably because sometimes you have a dev that actually cares about this in the backend. Um, but you can drop it, so client can send whatever garbage he wants to the backend. We drop all of those UTM uh, parameters in the URL, and the cache lookup is going to be a very clean one without all that noise and junk. But I think that, uh, like I mentioned, the biggest challenge is going to be cookies. Um, cookies, especially tracking cookies or persistent cookies, or devs that just try to load whatever it is in cookies, assuming it is something like local storage. To fix this, um, something called lazy session initialization can be used, as in only generate a session ID when you actually need one. On the login page, um, on the register page, on the shopping basket page, you name it. Not on say, the home page, that should be the same for all of us. XSRF tokens are a tricky beast. Um, what usually happens is you generate a session ID on the back end, show one on the front end, and if a user submits a form, those two should match. That stands on the concept of cookies and um, uniquely generated tokens. So that doesn't actually work in Varnish. There are workarounds. You can load those tokens via AJAX. Um, perhaps you can figure something out entirely different. But XSRF tokens are pretty hindrance, uh, pretty big hindrance um, when implementing Varnish. Not something you can easily, easily get around. And those tracking cookies, Google Analytics, um, basically any site that has ads on them, um, they will pollute your cookie in local storage tremendously. There's a whitelisting or a blacklisting approach to handling this. I showed the blacklisting one, which basically includes copy-pasting a lot of reg regular expressions to throw away those junk cookies. But as soon as one of those third-party uh, trackers introduces a new cookie, your blacklisting approach is broken. Um, more intelligent approach would be, of course, whitelisting. You just say, these five cookies I trust, all the rest I throw away, which can also be achieved with regular expressions. There's also a cookie vmod, um, but that usually requires compiling from source. There are no packages available by Varnish. Varnish also introduces a couple of um, more advanced but very interesting techniques, uh, especially surrounding caching. Edge side includes. Anyone ever heard of it? Frank, you don't count. <laughs> um, has anyone ever done programming in PHP or Ruby? A bit. You might know that there's something called an include statement. In a page, you can include different PHP pages, and PHP is going to assemble all of that generate an HTML and throw the HTML back to the client. In Varnish, you can do something similar, but Varnish is going to be the PHP to assemble all of these pieces. It allows you to cache parts of a page. Say, 
I log in versus someone else logs in, but it's um, tweakers.net. The, the, the body of the page is probably going to be the same. We're looking at the same news articles, but our hi John versus um, hi Matthias on the top right is going to be different. Edge side includes allows you to make that work without sacrificing too much of your caching. So it sort of works like HTML or PHP includes, except you're not actually including it in PHP. Varnish does the including. And you can have different cache policies per element on your page. Maybe, let's say tweakers.net, the home page might be cached for 10 minutes, but the price action ticker might be cached for 10 seconds. You can have different cache policies, policies per segment on a page. What does this look like? Assuming a diff typical uh, news website, you have your personal greetings on the top left, you have a navigation, some ads, some more ads, basically ads all over the place. What really matters is this. If you have a content blocker, you don't see any of that, but it exists out there, trust me. Um, this matters, and this pro can probably be cached, but your high username, that's unique, we can't cache that, um, or just in limited ways. How would you implement something like this? As a developer, or how you would tell your developers, um, in your source code, instead of using strong or href tags, you add additional HTML tags, which say ESI colon include. And then you give it a source. So your PHP or Ruby framework will generate weird looking HTML. That weird looking HTML will come into Varnish. Varnish will parse the DOM and realize that this is empty in the DOM, but it needs to fetch the content on the same host on that URL. So Varnish will connect to the backend, fetch that page, and inject that into the DOM. <laughs> in your source, it looked like this. So you have an ESI include with a, a URL. It's, it's an effective, uh, it's a GET request that will be sent, which is the equivalent of doing an include in PHP. You can add as many as you'd like. So navigation, two times the content, the, the benefit here being that the content is go only going to be fetched once. The next request, we already have it in the cache, so we can reuse that. Here's how that looks. If a user connects to uh, Varnish and says it wants to load laravel.com, um, it'll hit VCL receive, probably does a cache lookup, let's say it failed, so it makes a backend fetch. PHP does its thing, generating HTML, um, and it sends back a response which includes two ESI statements. So those ESI includes. Varnish will then on its own fetch those pages from the backend or from its cache, if it was available, assemble the entire HTML again, and then deliver that to the client. So it allows you to even, um, what most people think about of, of uh, Varnish and full page caching is that you have to sacrifice a bit of customization per user. Many of them use this by uh, introducing Ajax calls or JavaScript or client side DOM modifications. This is rather complex, especially to troubleshoot, um, or to explain to a developer to implement, or to troubleshoot on a dev setup, on say uh, on my Mac. I probably don't have Varnish running, so you'll need additional logic to handle that. But it's a very powerful way of still having custom elements on a page without sacrificing speed and performance. As I mentioned, it, each of those elements has its own TTL, it's time to live, um, aka how long can you cache this before requesting a new, uh, new version. By default, Varnish just listens to headers. Cache control headers, etax headers, expires headers. There's too many headers in HTTP to define how long a page can be cached. Varnish has a flow chart-like order uh, in which it listens to them. The easiest to implement is cache control. If your cache control headers either on the server or by the dev are set correctly, Varnish works, works out of the box, no harm. However, sometimes you end up with popular pages, you end up with um, malfunctioning servers, you name it. Um, in the backend response, so this block, if you remember, you can add logic to overwrite the DTL. Perhaps certain pages you can't cache or certain you must cache longer. Um, you can overwrite the DTL to whatever you'd like. Now this quickly becomes a unmaintainable list, so ideally you push this back as much to your developers as possible. Sometimes you have no choice. It's Saturday evening, your servers are down, you have to fix something. This gets it fixed. The developer probably isn't on call. <laughs>
I'd love to hear when it is the case. Um, additionally, um, like I mentioned before, you have something called a grace mode, where you can deliver objects outside of their TTL. So if an object has expired, but the next request comes in, you can serve that even if the TTL was expired while background fetching a new version. This also introduces a, a uh, defense mechanism for cache stampedes. So if you have a thousand users all requesting the same page, Varnish can make one request to the backend, keep all of those thousand users waiting, just do one request to the backend, send that back, and then serve its 1,000 users. Which sounds great in theory, but we all run servers, so we all know that a single request sometimes takes a bit longer than usual. So if that one request took, say, 10 instead of one second, those 1,000 users have been kept waiting for 10 seconds. Perhaps a second request might have been faster and might have delivered a faster result. So there's always a trade-off between convenience, uptime, performance, um, How would you implement Varnish in your own stack? Um, to get started, it's actually very, very easy. You install Varnish, obviously, part one. Um, I run a lot of Varnish templates on my GitHub page, basically lessons learned from downtime or whatever uh, from the previous years. Just run Varnish on the same server you run your web server, just on a different port. No harm done. Let your developers test it, um, test it yourself, see if everything works. So you. Test your functionality, of course. You swap your ports. Basically, your web server comes 8080, Varnish runs port 80, and you're good to go. Then comes your biggest question, of course, does it actually work? As in, am I getting cache hits, cache misses? Um, that's when you'll start to look at Varnish log or your monitoring. Troubleshooting, let's see how I am on time. Okay. It requires internet, of course, which I now have. Oh. Buddy of mine runs the Reggae Gale website. Super high traffic, of course, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, it's a typical Drupal stack which has Varnish running in front of it. Um, if you've ever run Drupal, you know that Varnish can come in handy. Um, there are a couple of tools on the command line that we as sysadmins can use. Let's see if I can zoom in a bit. Um, basically, varnish tap, and you have a lot of them. Uh, assume that there is varnish in front of this. <laughs> uh, you have a varnish ADM, an administration interface. Think Telnet-like interface that you can send commands to varnish. Um, you can show a histogram, which is fancy looking, but ultimately useless. Um, a varnish log, which dumps in plain text, the request and the responses from all of your visitors, which is very useful. But if you run this on a high traffic production server without parameters, you will dump all of the traffic, which might kill your console or the server. There's a tool called NCSA, which does varnish logging, um, but in a more Apache-like format, something more easily grokkable um, by both logs and us. There's a reload command uh, and a couple of commands that don't really um, come in handy that much, except for Varnish top. Let's look at it a bit. If everyone could uh, browse to reggaegale.com, that would be nice, um, because there probably isn't really that much traffic. Um, but I shall refresh, like mad. Okay. This is Varnish log. This has, and I can scroll for a very long time, um, all of the hits coming into the server. And there's a couple of key identifications here. So. There's a number in front. This is the 12, 17. This is a particular session on this server. It's a request, and if I scroll over, it's response. So request, we have a URL that we are fetching. We confirm the protocol. Um, we say that we'd like to visit the Reggae Gale. All the user agents, there will be a lot of cookies uh, at the bottom. You can see this in plain text. Um, here, we see what the server has actually done. So we are hashing the request. We try to determine what separates this one from the next user. Um, and we take the, the URL and the host header, but we don't see cookies. So this is probably, as the name would imply, a bot coming by without cookies. These two are hashed. Try to fetch it from its cache. It's a miss. So we have no cache hit. We have a cache miss. And we have to fetch it from our backend. Drupal does its thing and replies with an HTTP OK header, 
Um, a lot of headers that are being added by Drupal, blah, blah, blah. And then a deliver is now sent back to our end user. Um, if you do this on a high traffic site, you can't really keep this up. You can't just type varnish log and expect to troubleshoot things. Um, there's a couple of filters that you can use. Um, I can never remember the syntax, so we have scripts for this. Let's say that you want to filter everything coming from your magic IP address. Um, you can type varnish log. With the C, you indicate you want to see client side requests. Um, and you give it a modifier to say all of the requests that have started from a particular IP address. Client side requests are important because this will show everything coming into Varnish. If you just like to see whatever is being missed, aka what is being fetched from the backend, you add a dash B, and this will only show you backend requests that have originated from this IP address. So if you have a lot of cache misses and you know your own IP address, you can limit the scope to just you visiting the site. There's a varnish histogram, which is the cool one, but ultimately useless one. It'll show a histogram. And on a high traffic site, this is more impressive. Um, everything on this side are fast requests. Everything more on that side are slow requests. Pipes are cache hits. And hashtags or bounds um, are cache misses. Obviously, this side is dominated by pipe signs because these are cache hits, ergo fast responses. These are going to be um, the slower responses that are fetched from the back end. This is nice if you're running into a varnish um, on an unknown system and you just want to have a quick look, how is my caching doing? If you see a lot of these, not much caching. If you see a lot of these, a lot of caching. But you don't know which ones, you don't know which have failed, you have blah, blah. Without modifier, you can also just say, I want to see all the backend requests, as in show me everything that is being cache missed, what is being fetched from the backend. Um, let's take the 12 again. Should begin somewhere here. So we have a connection incoming, requesting a particular image, um, being hashed from the same, no, a bit lower. This is a, a fairly boring request because unless I'm missing it, there are no cookies. Ah, there you are. So cookies. The power and the evil of the internet. Uh, semicolon separated, so you have your key value, key value, and you can add whatever you like in this. Um, this is the part that needs most of your cleaning up. This GAT stuff, GID stuff, uh, all of these are tracking cookies, um, which is a fun exercise uh, if you just look into the browser what cookies are being set for a particular page. But these pollute your cache hit rate. What else did we have? So we have varnish log, which gives you the output above. A lot of detail, a lot of debug information. Um, you also have varnish NCSA. Um, someone could hit refresh. <laughs> okay. uh, which gives you more of an Apache Nginx-like output. Um, this is something that we also use if we would like to feed this to something like um, a traffic generator to count the bytes being served. This is the output that is easily comprehended by syslog or anything, because these are just there are ready-made filters for this. There are hardly any ready-made filters for the varnish log output. So varnish and CSA is useful if you want um, data traffic accounting to see how much each website is, being, uh, is using. Varnish top can also be an interesting one. Um, it gives you a top-like interface of calls happening. Um, left column is the count how many times a particular uh, request is coming in, in this case per second. So Per second, we are now serving something like 140 deliver requests. Nine times out of 10, these are just a lot of JavaScript images um, that increment that counter. Um, you can also see uh, if, for instance, you have one very, very popular page, that request URL is probably going to be somewhere at the top, indicating that that page is receiving a lot of requests. These are all separate mini tools that can help you identify where a potential non-caching issue is. Um, AKA something that should be cached that isn't cached. This is an interesting one. This is something where Drupal, in this case, actually sets its cache, cache control headers correctly. We probably don't have to look at the varnish configuration because Drupal can manage how long a particular page should be cached. What does this look like? The default VCL file. Um, 
it's missing sort of vital information. Uh, the, there are some more pound size to include uh, or to indicate comments. Um, this is something that can rapidly grow and is probably sort of custom per application that you deploy. Simple applications like Drupal, they just benefit with the defaults. Um, if you have a custom homegrown application, perhaps you'd like to exclude certain URLs from ever being cached. This is just added to the default of VCL file. And if you scroll through this, none of this is actual magic, but it is a lot of code, uh, in a sense, um, that just does normalization, in a sense. As in, if we're not receiving any of the known methods, just pipe it to the backend. There's a difference between um, varnish passing something to the backend or varnish piping something to the backend. A pass indicates that varnish is actually using the HTTP protocol to talk to the backend, get a page, deliver it back. Pipe implies that varnish is going to drop back to TCP IP layer um, and just drop bytes to the backend, receive bytes back and deliver that to the client. If there is ever a situation, uh, say you have WebSockets or you have a custom protocol implemented over HTTPS, you can't pass that to the backend. It's not HTTP that Varnish can grok. It is more lower level than that. You just pass TCP IP, get TCP IP back, deliver that to the client. A lot of this logic um, is available on my GitHub pages, um, which gives you copy-pastable versions that you can just get started with. Because by default, an apt install Varnish gives you a bit of VCL logic, but not a lot. Um, and instead of reinventing the wheel every time, um, here are some examples for backend definitions with probes. Varnish can also act as a load balancer, uh, separating requests for multiple backends. The probes can say which backend is alive versus which one isn't. You can define timeouts to make sure that if it's too slow, it won't be used anymore. Um, you can define ACLs. Perhaps you'd like to have cache purges from internal IPs but not your external IPs etc, etc. There's a lot of code in here that is just going to make your life hopefully easier. Copy paste this, get started and see where you can get. That's about it for the live demo because I think I'm sort of running out of time. Um, do you have any more questions? Now I can stop talking. None. So this was the most clear presentation, or you never understood a word I said. That's the latter. OK. <laughs> Shame on me. <laughs> OK. Um, try Varnish. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Uh, let me know if it works. Perhaps last disclaimer, if you don't need Varnish in your infrastructure, you probably shouldn't be installing it. It just adds complexity, um, powerful complexity, fun complexity, but complexity nonetheless. So if you have a fast application, you don't need the caching, don't bother. If your servers are dying, um, and you need performance, give Varnish a try. Okay, thank you. <laughs>